Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, July 21st, 2016, and this is the week in charts. All right, what do we talk about? Well, we're talking about the fact that technical analysis leads the way, but it doesn't have to be that technical. And yesterday I was thinking, what on world am I going to talk about? Am I going to talk about today? And I started thinking, you know, along the lines of technical analysis not being that technical, and the reason I'm thinking kind of like back to the beginning here so much lately is because I've been working on a beginner's course. And it's turned out to be a lot more work than I thought it would be. But the cool thing about it is it's, it's kind of making me rethink what I wish I knew 20-something years ago that I don't know now. And what if I only had a little bit of time to go back and talk to me, what would I say? And obviously, I'm not going to say, hey, you know, S&P is going to break out and uh, – <laughs> summer of uh, 2016, but more along the lines of uh, what actually works, keep it simple, stick to the basics. If you ever you find yourself drifting a little bit and trying to outsmart the markets, just ask yourself, are they going higher or lower? There will be losses and a lot of things like that. So I've really been thinking a lot about that lately, and I'm working on the course for the for the absolute beginner but a lot of times, I think a more seasoned trader could go back and rewatch this or watch this, especially if they hit a drawdown and they find themselves trying to outsmart the market, outthink the market, frustrated. You just sometimes have to come back to the basics and what is is. I'm going to talk a lot about that, too. And along those lines, I got to thinking about the TKO. And ironically, I started getting a lot of questions about TKOs over the last couple of days. So I do want to talk about the TKO, uh, answer those questions, and quite frankly, some of the awesome things about it. And then obviously your questions and your favorite stock picks. Mark says, hi, Dave, from Boris Johnson's Britain. Cheers, Mark. All right, Mark, glad to have uh, somebody across the pond checking in. Karen, where are you, New York or uh, Germany? I forget. Karen's in the house. This week's Week of Chart is brought to you by me. Once again, and there's my trading service. I do give sometimes daily recommendations. I publish service every day. And not every day there'll be recommendations, but a lot of times there's actionable signals. It's certainly ancillary ideas and a little bit of color commentary mixed in. So check it out. If you get a chance, you can get started at $47. You can follow along if you go to get started on my website. You can follow along for free in the delayed version with the delayed version you could also click on the middle of my website where i also have uh, i put up a delayed service roughly about a week or so old there's a disclaimer screen uh, as i often say the easiest way to sum that up is all predictions are about the future and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then if you get really bored you could always look at my website and read the entire disclaimer screen it has a lot of interesting things in there like uh if you smoke after sex, you're doing it too fast, you know, things like that. Anyway, before I digress too far and get myself into a lot of trouble, so what do we talk about? Well, one thing that I'm a huge fan of is the fact that technical analysis leads the way. And the beauty of technical analysis is it's the only system or method, however you want to look at it, where there is a concrete rule when it comes to the markets. There's no such rules and fundamentals or any other methodology. And that concrete rule is if a market is going from A to C and B is somewhere in between, it's going to have to pass through B. So if it's going from 5 to 10, I'm sorry, 5 to 20, I always get that wrong. It's going to have to pass through 10 along the way. So if ever you find yourself plotting that 15th oscillator, ask yourself, hey, where is the market relative to A and C. Now, you can't always buy at B, although I do have a, an IPO pattern that does just that, and the people who have watched the course, and shameless plug here, but I have gotten quite a few testimonies from people, uh, testimonials, from people who have uh, applied this pattern to IPOs, and they're pretty excited about it. I can't promise you that it will always work, but it's worked fairly well for the last couple of years. 
that, as I often preach, I don't use any news, fundamentals, or any other extraneous information. And as soon as I say that, Dave, what about the Brexit vote? Dave, what about the Fed? Dave, what about earnings? Read my lips. I don't use any news or fundamentals or any other extraneous animation. Information. Now my, uh, my screen just popped up. says playing animation. Uh, so if ever you do get confused, just go to do not confuse issues with facts.com. And I'll save you the, the click. That will bring you right back to my website. So what is technical analysis? It's something that I've been thinking a lot about recently. And technical analysis is really just – using charts to read the psychology of the other participants while at the same time embracing your own. So define trading with technical analysis is the use of charts to read the emotions of others while at the same time embracing your own. So as we look at the TKO and some of these other basic, 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 my mouth is not working today. Basic technical analysis type of setups and patterns and concepts. Remember, we're not trying to outsmart the market or have the moon go a certain way or counting a wave or <laughs> Fibonacci or something like that. I'll make fun of Fibonacci, but I do actually have one pattern that, that has a little tiny bit of Fibonacci in it, too, if you count IPOs. But for the most part, I, I try to avoid anything that kind of hints at numerology unless the pattern makes sense within the psychology of what's going on. So you're basically reading the psychology of the participants. You're trying to capitalize on emotions, and obviously you have your own emotions, which I often preach we can't get rid of because we are human beings and we still have a pulse. In the bottom line, in today's theme, I think, is that technical analysis doesn't have to be that technical. And as I often say, you need to ask yourself, is the market higher than it was a day ago, a week ago, a month ago, a year ago, five years ago? Is it lower than it was a day ago, a month ago, a week ago, five years ago? Or, and this is kind of tricky for a lot of people, is it about the same? It's not always in an uptrend and it's not always in a downtrend. Sometimes it just goes sideways. And getting back to the basics, and I know some of you guys are probably, your eyes are probably glazing over, but the next time you find yourself fighting a trend, or the next, you, next time you find yourself holding on to a stock as it drops and goes lower and lower and lower and lower, and you are a trend follower, and it's taken your stop out a long time ago, ask yourself, these three questions about the market. Is there demand? In other words, is the market headed higher? Is there supply? Is the market headed lower? And if you've been stopped out and you're still holding on, it's no longer a trend. It might be a downtrend. There might be supply coming into the market. And if it's going lower and lower, then there is supply. And then the toughest part of all, again, is equilibrium where demand is equal to supply. So you need to always truly truly ask yourself, again, that mouth thing's not working today, which state is it in? Now, it might not be what you want, and that's the bottom line is, and that's okay, okay? You have to embrace that. It might not be what you want, but unless you're Bill Clinton, of course, what is, is. Now, once you think you have a trend, you need to ask yourself, is the trend accelerating? And this is what an accelerating trend looks like. And I have a very simple strategy I call accelerating momentum strategy. And all we're doing is we're drawing a trend line under the bars and then drawing a trend line, another trend line, and it looks like that. So it, it's kind of gradual and then it accelerates higher. And then the other question you need to ask yourself, is the trend decelerating? Is the market losing some steam? Yes, it might still be going higher, as we'll see in the next slide. But is the market beginning to lose steam? And then if you draw it kind of like on a on a curve basis, could it be possibly rolling over? Okay. And that kind of hints at emerging trends or trend transitions, which is a little bit more complex but if you get the trends down, you're well on your way. And some of these other concepts we'll talk about today. So, again, you don't want to forget about that net net. I, I get a lot of 
charts from people or a lot of get a lot of questions on stocks. We'll probably get quite a few today from those of you who are a little bit newer to trend trading. And that's OK. Uh, you know what? You got to start somewhere. And if you believe in what I say, you're going to be well on your way and you're not going to be maybe five or 10 years from now when you find yourself fighting the market. Just like, hey, wait, let me just go back to this this little trend following thing that Dave talks about, like acceleration versus deceleration, up arrows, down arrows, and of course the sideways arrows, and your life will get a lot easier. But I'll get a lot of stocks that look like this, and then they'll pull back a little bit, and then people will say, hey, Dave, how do you like that pullback? And I'm like, well, if you look at the chart, you can see that, yeah, it's uh, going nicely higher over a period of time, but in more recent times, it has begun to lose momentum. Now, I probably should have drawn a few more bars in here, but sometimes people say, what do you think about this pullback? And the pullback, it's like the market hasn't gone anywhere in like 20 bars or 30 bars. So like four weeks to six weeks, sometimes even eight weeks of sideways action. And people will say, hey, Dave, is that a pullback? It's like, no. If anything, it looks like it could be a market in, tr in a transitional phase. In other words, rolling over. So draw your arrows, but make sure you're also drawing the short-term arrows, too. Like I said earlier, is the market higher than it was a day ago, a week ago, a month ago, two months ago? Okay. And then, of course, look at that longer-term trend, too. But make sure you're looking at the short-term to make sure that it hasn't lost momentum. Now, another very powerful concept is the concept of persistency and with persistency it's a beautiful thing and I learned this early on in my trading there were a few stocks that just just go up day after day after day and I was just enamored with it. it was just like it was amazing and I just thought wow I just love the way these stocks just go up day after day after day like Leo Melaman said you know be a lover not a fighter and I, I used to just love these stocks I was amazed that they could just do this day after day after day I said there is something there with this persistency and mathematically, it's equivalent to linear regression, but I just like to draw a line through as many bars as possible to illustrate that. Now, the other question you need to ask yourself is, let's say you do have a setup and the, and the stock does trade cleanly. It does. It has some acceleration. It has some persistence. See, all these other great things I talk about, it has all those things in it by the way somebody just sent me an email i said dave could you explain to me everything i need to know about uh trading a stock thank you and i'm like i'm flattered that they would ask me that but it's like well i spent 14 hours at a course just on that so get the course watch the course or come to every one of these mark uh watch every market in a minute obviously come to every one of these weekend charts go back and watch the last hundred or so however many I have up on YouTube, and while you're at it, watch the other 1,600 YouTubes, and then watch the other 500 posts that I have on my website. Or, of course, jumpstart all that by starting with the course itself. But what I thought about this morning is if you don't have this course along the lines of show me everything you need to know, well, I don't have 14 hours today to show you everything you need to know, but if you at least follow these few concepts, and again, those more advanced people are like, uh, I know that. I have a friend of mine. His wife um, was uh, – <laughs> he. it's kind of a long story, but long story endless. Uh, he told her something that was a very Captain Obvious statement, and uh, they're from Mississippi. And she says, I know that, David. So it's like uh, you, you guys are probably thinking as I show you some of these simple concepts, you know, I know that, David. But when you're fighting a trend – a week from now, a month from now, a year from now, or five years from now, think back, okay? You're fighting that trend. Why are you fighting that trend, okay? I thought you'd do that, David. Anyway, so another thing you ask yourself is where would someone look to get out at break even if you think you have the mother of all setups? And that's just simply overhead supply. Now, this isn't the hugest example in the world, but it does make for a good example this was one a while back that really caught my eye. I made like a double bottom, made a cup and handle, and it also was a bow tie. Now, I don't necessarily trade off of classical technical analysis patterns like a double bottom, 
But if I see a bow tie set up after a double bottom or a triple bottom or a big saucer or a big cup or something like that, I am all over it. So I do remember this one specifically because I was so focused on this side of the chart, the right side of the chart, that I forgot to look at the left. Okay. By the way, if you find somebody who lets you trade off, a broker that will let you trade off the left side of your chart, please let me know. Anyway. So I'm all excited about this really good looking setup. It's a first thrust. It's probably a bow tie. It's a cup and handle. It's it's all kinds of things, right? Does it, it's not just my patterns. It's other people's patterns too in setups. But then you look back at time and you can see that there is some overhead supply between 10 and 11. So by the time you get in, you're probably going to get in somewhere around here. So this could possibly cap your trade. The other thing that's kind of jumping out at me is that you do have a gap here. Now, gap creates a bit of a... And I hate to use the word vacuum because that that creates some sort of uh, mystique about it, like it's going to have to be filled or something. But it does create uh, a spot in time where people may be looking to get out of break even because they're not only on the hook, but now they're they are, they're in trouble. And psychologically a gap can really put pressure on people. You will find that gaps tend to be a resistance zone, okay? Especially when they're above the market like this and a support zone when they're below the market because it creates a bit of a, a vacuum in the trading. Now, the main thing I'm showing you here, not so much the gap, but the gap is important. The main thing I'm gonna show you is that you've got a lot of trading in this zone here. And as I said last week, human nature never changes. It's human nature to look to get out of break even. Like I said, in my last column, I think it was last week and a week before, a friend of mine showed up and we start talking about stocks and he tells me about the stock he bought and then he bought more and then he bought more. And then he bought some when it got really low, thinking he could flip it out and get back to break even, uh, back where up where he bought some, some more shares. So that human nature never really changes and that's the beauty of technical analysis now along those lines uh, the beauty of the trend knockout pattern is it's really just a cool pattern and the more i think about it the more i like it and i'll define the pattern here in just one second for those of you who aren't familiar with it but one of the great things about it is occasionally you get a nicely defined entry and a nicely defined stop point which thereby also gives you the initial profit target. And this will make a little sense when we get to the next screen. So let me just walk you through a TKO really quick. The, the reason I want to talk about these nicely defined points is if you're trading a pullback, you never really know if, if the pullback is deep enough and where to put your entry and where should your stop be just in case it keeps pulling back. But sometimes with the TKO, a lot of these things are automatically defined for you. But to those who aren't familiar with the pattern, we're looking for ideally a strong trend. You should be able to draw a big arrow on a chart. And I've got the dots in here because this was a serious trend coming into this uh, pattern here. And you can't see it on this chart, but it's also acceleration. But even on a, on a micro level, you could see this chart was beginning to accelerate higher. And then bam, you get this big wide range bar down. Now wide range bar down, is very important okay as you're gonna see in a second I'll show you a bit of a mediocre example that does fit the rules but it's missing the wide range bar down now the the official rule is that it must take out at least two lows and you can see in this particular case I've got it drawn in for you it's taken out one meaning traded below two three four Five. So you go back in time to see how many lows got taken out. So five lows, that's at least one week's worth of trading has gotten taken out. Good question, Mark. We'll get to that in a second. It's, that's an arbitrary type of thing, but we'll talk about that. And I might have a good example for you. So again, you want a wide range bar down. Now getting back to the concept here is that occasionally you get a nicely defined entries and you get a nicely defined stop point, which thereby give you the initial profit target. So let's take a look at what that might look at look like so you got an entry which would be here which is just above the bar if you get a nice wide range bar down now ideally 
you want to see this close a little lower. I'm just kind of noticing this in my slide uh, because this entry in this particular case, this might be a little confusing. So imagine the close is actually down here. And I'm, I forgot to put that in before we got started. So let's let's start over. So instead of the close being here, let's imagine the close is way down here. So if the market comes all the way back up and takes out this high, then you have a bona fide entry. Then you know that that stock might be reversing. Okay. I didn't notice this when I set the slides up. My apologies. Um, but yeah, you want this. When you put an entry this close, you want to make sure this close is a little further down. Okay. Now, once you say, there's my entry point, well, where's your stop going to be? Well, if it's, if it comes all the way back here and triggers, then it shouldn't go all the way back down. So you could put your stop somewhere below that low. And if the bar is a really nice wide range bar, it doesn't have to be too far below that low. You might give it a little bit of wiggle room, but you don't have to go too far below it. Now, once you define your entry and your stop, now you know where your initial profit target will be. So you take that distance and you add it to your entry. And then that gives you your initial profit target. Now, that's a one for one basis. If you're risking five points, you're taking profits at five points, partial profits. I italicize the word initial because we're taking half of our profits off and the way we make the risk to reward profile work and avoid the so-called negative expectancy, meaning that we're losing more than we're making on the trade is through the occasional home run. The beauty of the technical knockout is sometimes you'll get a market that begins to go somewhat parabolic. You have a big knockout move and then it takes off. It goes parabolic yet again. So you can take a little swing trade out and then get in for Hopefully, and you hate to use the word hope in this business, but hopefully a longer term trend. Now, the question is, what sort of percentage drop is too much for TKO? I have a chart that's going to come up in a few minutes where that will make a little bit more sense. But if your drop, if your TKO brings you back into a base, it's too big. And then sometimes you just have to eyeball it. Like one of my best setups I had uh, over the last couple of years was one where it was on the cusp of being actually being too big. The other question is, uh, okay, I answered your question. All right, well, it, it'll make sense too, uh, Arsity. We'll get to the, to the chart on that. So I'll, I'll leave you, or your other question up. Um, now, here's the thing that's, that, that's kind of interesting too. And this is something that it's impossible for me to quantify but it's such an important concept. I can't drive the point home enough. In order to win, it helps not to lose to begin with. So no trigger, no trade. And I'm amazed at how many losing trades we miss by simply waiting for an entry. Okay. As I often preach, I hate to even say it. I say it so many times, but... I get emails from people. Oh, Dave, I'm losing. Uh, I'm down 50% in that, that stinker stock you recommend. And I'm like, well, what stock is it? Mm -hmm. Oh, XYZ. It's like, I don't, I never recommended that. It's like, yes, you did. I'm like, no, I didn't. When did I recommend it? You know, and it goes back and forth. Finally, I'm like, oh, yeah, I did recommend that six months ago. And it never triggered. It, it, it just was taken completely off of my screens, taken off the radar because it was no longer set up. So, no trigger, no trade. Very simple, simple, simple concept of a trigger, meaning that if you're buying a stock, it has to be going higher when you buy it. Write that down if you're a little newer to trading. Don't try to catch that falling knife. So with the TKO, and this is one that I showed as a setup coming into today, and this this is going to ask, uh, this is going to answer a few questions. Leon says, you mean only enter buy trade on strength? Absolutely. You're not trying to catch a falling knife, okay? So you might have said, oh, that's a day, that's a TKO. 
uh, I'm going to get in on the close and, and well, look what happens the next day. It gaps lower. So somebody was saying, how big is too big on a TKO? Well, you could see that this stock lost a little momentum in here, did kind of base, and then it took off again. And that's fine. You, it's okay for a stock to go up, base, take off, and do this, okay? But you could see that this TKO was pushing back towards that somewhat of a base in here. So anything much lower than that would be to answer the question of uh, Mark, who says, what sort of percentage drop is too much for a TKO? Anything much lower than where it is here would be a little bit too extreme for a TKO. So let's just imagine this bar went all the way down to here. So at this juncture, it's going down below this prior kind of base-ish type of range. So that would probably be too long. Now, as far as percentage, it depends on the volatility of the stock. In some cases, you might have a 30% bar down in a super duper volatile stock. Okay, So it has to be a little bit more extreme than the volatility of the stock. But it can't be so extreme that it looks like a bona fide crash or a bona fide market reversal. But here's the other beauty of the TKO. Okay, let's say you did know. Let's say it did TKO down to here. And you're like, geez, is this too wide or not? I think it's okay. So you put an entry up here. Well, if it crashed this much, there's a pretty slim and none chance that it's going to come all the way back up. It triggered. If it does, then maybe you do have the mother of all trend knockouts. So again, and it's amazing that you know, like, why wow, he's really selling TKOs today? Well, it's free. I'm giving you. I'm giving the pattern away. Okay, so I don't know why I'm working so hard to sell you a free pattern, but I am selling you on tactical analysis in that something simple like this can work, and it can work quite well, especially if you're patient. And you take only the best of the best setups. So again, even if you're not sure, and this is where the tough part is a reading of the charts. And that's why I spent 14 hours talking about how to read charts, how to pick the best setups. But even if you didn't know, if you didn't have a feel for how big is too big, and it again, it came all the way down here, then your entry up here more than likely won't get triggered. So you'll avoid the losing trade anyway. So this is one that I showed yesterday, and it was a good look at TKO. And this has been a really nice persistent stock for a long time. Okay, consolidated a little bit, but then it went back to being persistent and accelerated higher. If you draw that trend line below the lows like I talked about earlier, you can see it begins to accelerate higher. So coming into yesterday, it's like, okay, guys, let's enter here. Let's put a stop here. Remember earlier I said you could put the entry right above the high. Well, this is the one, this is what I meant to put in because the, the close is really low here. Um, so if you close this way down here, you can put your entry right here, stop right here, and then your initial profit target is this distance up here, as I just showed. But what happened? The stock gaps lower. So now this stock looks like a bona fide reversal because it has a gap against the trend. Now I'm I'm gonna I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but somebody asked me about gaps and trend. You don't want a gap against the trend. I have a list of what I call trend qualifiers, and one of them is gaps. The gap should only a gap should only be in the direction of the trend unless it's a foreign stock which has an overnight gap by by proxy because it traded uh, overseas. Or in some cases, I'm a little bit more lenient with commodity-related stocks. So you're going to see me probably recommend some gold stocks here very soon, and possibly we might even talk about some today that have gaps against the trend because sometimes these very efficient markets, such as commodities, can have some gaps, and then stocks that are often influenced by efficient markets, such as oils and golds and other metals, can have some gaps against the trend. So, again, if you miss enough losing trades, okay, you're like, wow, this is a great trend. I've got to get in. And then what happens, stop against the implode without you, then no trigger, no trade, no harm was done, no capital was put in the harm's way. And then you go off and try to find something else. Now, it's impossible to quantify not losing, okay? 
And eventually, obviously, you have to win on some things, but not losing is huge, as Donald Trump would say. Okay. So great setup, awesome looking setup, almost a textbook TKO, and then gaps low the next day. So we scratch the trade. So again, we get our buy. The stock implodes the next day. We say, never mind, and then we scream next. So we look for another setup. Okay. TKO is taking advantage of the people's fear and pain. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because that's one thing that, that I that I fully intended on talking about. But as I got questions and emails this morning, I kind of lost a little sight of that. And, and I'm, thank you for bringing that up. The whole reason behind, the whole reasoning behind a TKO is that we're looking for people to get knocked out of the trend. It's a trend knock out, TKO. We want people to be knocked out of the trend. And again, technical analysis is reading the psychology of the market participants while at the same time embracing your own emotions. Not trying to control your emotions, which is impossible, but embracing them. I don't want to get into a long psycho uh, psychological study, but uh, a conversation because we talk about this quite often. But just know that you have to embrace and accept your emotions. So in this particular case, or in the case of the TKO, I should say, when you have a wide range bar down, that tends to knock out the Johnny come lately. People just kind of throw in a towel like, oh, I can't stand it anymore. I'm just going to buy this stock. Well, those last in tend to be first out. There's a bit of a LIFO thing going on. There's a little MBA term for you. See, I thought my MBA was completely worthless, but maybe not. Maybe occasionally I have a little term that can come up. So they tend to be the last out and first. They tend to be the last in, first out. The Johnny come lately. So the Johnny come latelys can really wreak havoc on your trade. They're very skittish traders. They don't have much staying power, either from a monetary standpoint or from an emotional standpoint. So when you get a nice, longer-term, beautiful trend like this, the whole world can see it. Even Big Dave is drawing his big blue arrows on the chart, and other people are all of a sudden drawing arrows on the chart. It's obvious. So at some point, especially with persistency, persistency could be a Chinese water torture. And that's, what I, that's one reason I love it so much. Very rarely do you get it on a downside. But what you do, it's worth trading because what could happen is eventually the market just caves in. Not all the time, but quite often. And on the upside, it could be a bit of a Chinese water torture where people just feel like they're forced in. And then that creates variations of TKOs, like one of which I call the Arbalist TKO, which I was going to talk about today, but it's just not enough time. But that's when you have, you have a nice little trend going on, and then you have a wide range bar up then a wide range bar down. Let me redraw that a little bit better. So let's say you have a really nice little trend. You have a wide range bar up and then all of a sudden a wide range bar down. So in this particular case, you know a lot of people got sucked in. They got sucked in and then spit out. Okay. It all sounds a little cruel and unusual, but unfortunately that's how it is. That's what, that's what trading with technical analysis is. You're reading the emotions of the others. In a pattern like the TKO, you're capitalizing on those emotions. So two things happen when a market is plodding along, making new highs like this, or even accelerating new highs. You're going to get some Johnny come lately. You're also going to get some, uh, some shorts who might throw in a towel, and then all of a sudden the market rolls back over. They might pile right back on. And you also might have some shorts that are sucked in because they'll think that that market does not deserve to be that high. And when that market begins to sell off, they might even put on more and more shares. And if the market turns around and goes right back up, those shorts are going to give you that initial pop 
to throw you back up to new highs. And then sometimes the Johnny come lately's will come right back in because they'll be like, oh, dang it. And they'll come right back in. And that'll help to propel your position higher. And sometimes it's almost like that rubber band stretch stretching down. And it pops right back up and it gives you that swing trade out of the trade. Okay. Is there an automated scan screen we could use to identify TKOs? I haven't written one, but uh, eventually I'll probably have uh, someone like Metastock. Years ago, I programmed my uh, all of my stuff in the Metastock. And then subsequently, I just got really into looking at a lot of charts. And I still look at a lot of charts. Um, and the scan that I run now is very rudimentary. It's a very simple pullback scan. But I realize a lot of people want something a little bit more defined. I would still encourage you to look at a lot of charts. And I use a variety of charting packages. I, I happen to use telecharts a lot or telechart a lot because I'm able to look at a lot of stocks. But I do use other stuff. And eventually, uh, there's some good folks over at Metastock. I'll probably, I'll probably have my indicators uh, program for Metastock. Again, if I can't find the old code somewhere, but um, no, I don't have any scans, but it, it wouldn't be that difficult, I think, to write. You would look for a wide range bar relative to the stock, okay, and then relative to maybe the maybe a, a one month period or something like that. The um, the only problem with quantifying things is you might have a setup that's on the cusp that's a really good setup that might be one penny off from the scan. So if you do create scans, I would encourage you to create loose parameter scans. And the way I got into looking at charts was many, many years ago, we would run scans on old slow computers. And now when I refresh my scans, I think it takes about uh, 20 seconds or 10 seconds, if that much. And that, that includes like the, the refresh of the data too. But many, many years ago, in the late 90s, a scan, the scans that we used to run would take 45 minutes to run. So while those scans were running, I would get on another computer and I'd just start looking at charts. And by the time those scans were finished, I'd have the setups that I needed. And then I'd go in and say, oh, yeah, the scan picked up those uh, stocks, too. So nothing wrong with scanning, but never forget to look at charts and don't try to quantify things too much, okay? And then once you do get the scan results, then you have to whittle through those and pick the best of the best, too. It seems that a scan for the morning star candlestick pattern might be similar to a TKO. Uh, yeah, I'm not, I, I've forgotten most of my candle patterns already. Um, it could be a, uh, is, it, is it a hanging man, maybe, or a hammer or something? I don't know. Well, it would be a hanging man within a trend, I guess. But, yeah, I don't want to show my ignorance on um, candlesticks. I'm not a candle guy. And the reason I'm not a candle guy is because the candle people tend to always make a pattern. It's always a pattern. Sometimes the market's just choppy and going sideways. Again, let's go back to the net-net. Sometimes it's just going sideways. It's not always three birds crapping on a wire or a baby with a poopy diaper or a sumo wrestler with his uh, whatever you call that thing up his butt, you know, uh, fighting another one, holding on to the other one's belt, trying to rip off his underwear. You know, it's not always these patterns. It's not always a pattern. And, like, sometimes people are like, well, here's a reversal pattern. It's like, well, what are you reversing? And, and that's even, you know, Greg Morris has written a lot about candles. He's a good friend of mine. He actually went to Japan and studied candles. And uh, I think this had became more popular because I think his Nissen's books might have come out a little bit sooner than Greg's. But Greg was actually over there studying candles with, uh, with the masters, okay? But even Greg will tell you, with people with these reversal patterns, it's like, well, what are you reversing? You have to first have a trend to reverse. And even in a lot of these candle books, I have problems with some of the patterns I show. And you could pick out a half a dozen of their patterns where nothing ever happened. So it's it's always a pattern. That's my biggest beef, I suppose, with the candle people. But if it's what you're used to using, then by all means, use it. Don't let me get you back on the Western chart, okay? Uh, I was heavily into candles, and then I hooked up with some old school guys, wouldn't know a candle for hit him in the butt. 
and they they kind of saw it as I guess they didn't even know about them. So and if they did know about them, they see it as a fad. So they just kept their old charts, and I was like, well, you know what? I'm I need to go back to my old charts because I'm working with these guys, and and that's how I went back to the the Western charts. All right, the question is, do you look at TKO setups differently if the sell-off begins with a gap down in price? As always, thanks for your consideration. So if you have a TKO that looks like this, and there's a gap here, okay, if it's a small gap and it's like a an oil stock or metals and mining, then, then maybe it might be okay. But as a general rule, if there's a gap against the trend, then I avoid the TKO, okay? So that's the quick answer to that question. So again, if there's a gap, don't take the trade unless it's a small gap in a commodity-related stock or a very, very small gap in something like a biotech or a more volatile stock. But as a general statement, if there's a gap, easily recognizable gap within the pattern, toss it out. Howard says, bought some TK, TCK when it went over yesterday's high of 1340. This morning is at a TKO. Uh, we'll take a look at that when we get to the uh, charts. So uh, just to just close, uh, Leon's thought is, yes, you're capitalizing on the fear and greed of people with the TKO. You're capitalizing on the FOMO, the fear of missing out, and you're also capitalizing on the shorts who have – shorts for some reason – have big egos as a general statement, okay? Now, I know there's some shorts out there that are probably trend followers or certainly waiting for some sort of transition or trends, the successful ones. But a lot of shorts tend to have ego problems, and they want to short a stock because it's high. Well, just because it's high can't – doesn't mean that it won't continue to go higher. And, and again, that's what a TKO comes in because it initially – it initially makes them think, hey, this stock has finally died. I have been vindicated, and I've been shorting this uptrend, and I'm going to short even more. And when it turns right back around, then it, it begins to hurt them, and then they have to bail out. And how do, you, how do you get rid of a short? You cover the short by buying, and then that buying – propels the market higher. I'm not anti-shorts. I think shorts are a great thing. Shorts is just pent up buying. So the more people short a market, the more buying that's going to have to happen down the road. I know, stock can go bankrupt, but for the most part. Question is, if meat was technically a TKO pattern, would 680 be a good place to get in or would you use a higher entry? Now, I don't know if RJ is talking in hypotheticals, but I have to wonder what would the world be without hypothetical questions? Now, let's take a look at that chart. So he's saying, would 680 be a good entry? I don't know what the high is on here, but I'm assuming that's somewhere in here. Well, the problem is, this is not really a TKO, okay? Notice this bar right here. It's, it's actually small in this bar right here. And then you have quite a few bars that are the same size, Okay, as is TKO, just kind of at a quick glance on this chart, okay, and almost the same size. So this really is not a wide range bar. I mean, it might be wide range bar on a relative basis, on somewhat relative basis, but it's not enough knockout. So, but Dave, how much a knockout do you want? Well, you want to see something kind of meaningful, something that looked like that, okay. The, the litmus test for the TKO, and I'm just, I'm just kind of back in my head. I'm thinking I didn't realize there was so much to them, but this could probably be a whole course in and of itself. But the litmus test for TKO is you have to ask yourself, self, if I were long this particular market, would this wide range bar down have stopped me out? Okay. Now, it doesn't happen often, but I can think of one particular case. It was a little biotech IPO. I, it escapes me the name of the stock, but some of you guys in the service might remember. It's a couple years ago or a year and a half ago at least, where we actually were along the stock, and we actually did get knocked out of the position. Okay, We got stopped out on a TKO, and then that night 
It's like cut and paste. I stuck the same setup right back in to the service, adjusted the parameters a little bit. Okay. So sometimes you will get, you will be long, you will get knocked out. And that's when you have to reevaluate it and say, well, wait a minute, is this thing worth going after again? But if you're not already long a market, kind of in your mind's eye, ask yourself, self, where would my stop be if I were long this market based on the volatility of the market? And if you had a bar, it looks something like this. I would say there's a pretty good chance you'd get stopped out, especially if you were in a, in a somewhat shorter term trade, okay, as opposed to like a longer term trend following mode. So if you would have been stopped out in your mind's eye, that's probably a pretty good TKO. Okay. So again, to answer his question, this did take out two bar low, which technically does define it as a TKO. But for me to get excited, it would have to take out many more bars. So maybe like down to here, which would take out, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So in this case, it would take out two weeks worth of trading. Okay. So hopefully that made sense. Oh, here we go. <laughs> I forgot that I did the animation. So for me to get excited about a stock that looks like this, the TKO would have to look like that. Okay. So to see something that looked like that, I would get a little bit more excited about. Okay, we'll take a look at that in one second. Now, as far as the market, and you know, keep the keep the questions coming about uh, live TKOs. That's great because we're getting ready to jump into the um, individual charts. In fact, you guys want to start asking questions about stocks? You can start now. We'll be in the charts in just a few minutes. Um. I left this slide in from last week, and I have to admit, it's getting better all the time as far as the market is concerned. Uh, it seemed a little skittish on that Brexit deal. So it's like we had the first test of the market, the first serious news event, and the market kind of had a little bit of a panic to it. So that makes me wonder, what's the makeup of the market's players? You don't want to think too much, but then in the back of my mind, and something that you can't completely ignore is like, okay, when you see a market sell off like that, that tells me there's a lot of Johnny come latelys in the market. Okay. People that might have gotten shaken a few times in the past, and then they're finally thinking, you know what? I, I, I can't stomach this. I'm getting out. So, as I said last week, some possible nervous Nellies in there. Uh, the overbought nature, which we'll take a look at in just one second when we we'll get to the actual charts. But sometimes at a market, when a market's at new highs like this, and then it sells off hard and then has that V-shaped recovery, it's hard to mount a new leg on top of the old leg. It's hard to run a race right after you have just ran a race, okay? So that's always of concern. But if it does begin to take off, the nature of the correction will be kind of interesting. So if it just makes a little quick correction in both magnitude, not too much magnitude and not too much time and not too much distance, I guess, then by all means, we might have a bonafide new new big leg on our hands. Now, last week I said some sectors are still questionable. What's kind of interesting is this week we've actually had a few sectors that have begun to improve. Drugs, and then some of the sectors that were breaking out last week continue to break out, like semiconductors, et cetera. We'll take a look at those in just one second. Bonds are a little bit in nosebleed territory, but again, there's always something to worry about. And like I said last week, there is a potential for a second mouse type of signal. And second mouse signal just means you have a major sell signal, and that one doesn't work or doesn't work very well, as this one sort of didn't really work out that well. And then you get another sell signal that follows it up, and that's kind of like the real deal. This is kind of like a... There's probably an earthquake uh, analogy to this where you get like some tremors and then you get the real deal. Now, somebody was, was asking me all about this minor buy signal in here. It's like I don't really pay attention to the minor buys that much, although I do in the back of my mind think, okay, market's improving. We have a minor buy. I don't necessarily take that action, take any action based on that. In fact, I don't necessarily run out and take a whole lot of action based on a major sell signal other than I become more and more prudent. Like I said last week and in prior weeks, 
market timing can be really tough, okay? It's much easier, not that it's easy, but it's much easier to find individual stocks and to trade individual stocks and to capture trends in individual stocks than it is to capture trends in the market overall. So again, the signal was reset when we went on to make new highs. Major signal because it's coming off of major highs, in this case, all-time highs. So if we get another signal in here, the early bird gets the worm, but the second mouse gets the cheese. So I'm not saying that's going to happen, but you have to think through all these plausible scenarios. And again, there's always something to worry about. Okay. The bottom line, though, what is is, okay, the market's making new highs, at least the S&P 500. So we have to say, well, we certainly don't want to be really bearish in here. We don't have to label ourselves bullish or bearish, but we don't want to fight the trend. And in fact, we want to do just the opposite. We want to figure out where we should get on. That trend might end tomorrow. We don't know. But we need to think about where we, we should get on. Now, buying into an over market, overbought market is not exactly prudent, but it's okay to get ready to get ready. As I said last week, you won't always look smart as a trend follower. Sometimes you'll be a little late to the game. But if the market is making new highs, you have to continue to be a trend following moron. And as I've said before, I was called this once and I had some buttons and T-shirts made that say just that. Okay, um, I don't know what these announcements are, but let me just go through them real quick. Uh, website rollout continues. Uh, you guys, uh, I think I'm pretty much done, but I'm, I'm tweaking a lot of things. So if you guys have any feedback, let me know. Uh, I think the content is much more accessible now. It's like uh, I'm people who, people that are somewhat peers or um, you know, radio show host and, and people like that have found are beginning to somehow find a site maybe through some seo stuff that i've done um but they're like wow you have all this content and then i think just a couple of years ago somebody said you know i just it was wasn't easy but i did a lot of digging and you have a lot of content I'm not sure why you hide it so the content is not so much hidden anymore but uh, please let me know if there's something else or that uh, something i can do or something you think would make it better. Uh, the rollout continues of the uh, old content. I'm getting a lot of weekly charts updated to um, to YouTube and putting those on the back end of the website. So as you dig further and further into the website, you're going to find a lot of older content. But a lot of that stuff is really good. I mean, I did a search yesterday uh, because I was in a webinar on uh, money management and one of the topics we talked about was stops. So during the webinar, I did a search on YouTube and I found like 50 or 60 videos. And some of those went back years on money management. And that has really never changed. In fact, the methodology really hasn't changed over the last 20 something years since I've been doing it. There's been a few little tweaks here and there, but other than that, it really hasn't changed, especially something like money management. So if you go in and watch those really old videos, it's still pretty good. Um, still working on the beginner's course, as I said, and then again, just go to my website. I do answer all my own emails. Sometimes that becomes a bit of an eventually. I try to get to the people on the surface as, service as fast as possible. And in fact, what I've been doing in more recent times is I've been um, posting the answers on the service page. So not if you're on a delayed, but if you're on the live service page, you're going to see a plethora of questions that are being answered relative to the setups and I think that that's a great way to to build content that's useful for the users especially since it's, it's it's happening in real time so I think it's a really worthwhile feature and the feedback on that has been phenomenal so I want to thank you guys for that all right let's jump into the charts and then we'll start answering I'm going to answer the questions on the TKOs first and then uh, we'll take a look at the overall market and then we'll start um, then we'll go to individual stocks, but feel free to ask anything at this point. Okay. Bought some T TCK when I moved over yesterday's high 1340. Uh, this morning was out of TK. Oh, TCK, TCK. Now, okay, the problem is, or it's certainly not a TKO. Well, you know what? It's my pattern. I could say no. <laughs> Sometimes I forget that. Um, 
No, this is not a TKO because you had a breakout and then it came all the way back in to where it broke out. Okay. So it's that net net problem we just talked about. So let's just kind of measure that and keep in mind, this is a fairly volatile stock. So 7%, 8%, but that really isn't that much when you consider how volatile this stock is. I mean, it moves, let's just see, see what this bar was here. Yeah, it moves 9%. It can move 9% in one day. So based on the volatility, you kind of have to squint your eyes a little bit. And you could see that that wouldn't be a, a legitimate TKO because it, it gave up all of those gains. It broke out here, broke out here, and then it gave up all of those gains. So it, it might go higher, but... I wouldn't take the trade. And here's the deal. Metals and mining stocks are going straight up. We're going to look at quite a few of them today. But that, so you should be able to find something that has a little bit more momentum than this, okay? Did GDX have a TKO pattern as of yesterday? Let's take a look at that, Donald. Good question. Uh, we do have a um, gold stock on the radar Today, that was a TKO. I would say yes to some extent. This is a TKO. Now, what did I just say about gaps? You throw them out, they have a gap. But in something commodity related like this, let's not get as excited about a small gap, okay? So it's not a horrible gap. Uh, but if you did take an entry off of it, maybe put your entry a little bit above the gap, okay? A little tip there kind of thrown in. So, yeah, that's a TKO. Um, I would like to see even more of a TKO, okay? But it's not bad. I would like to see a little bit more of a knockout move in a case like this based on the magnitude of the trend because this thing is kind of going straight up lately. So I'd like to see a TKO, something maybe like that, a little bit more like bam, okay? Gold miners got capped and TKO'd yesterday. Thoughts? Uh, gold miners. Let's take a look at that. Do, 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 right there. Yeah, that's a little bit, a little bit more obvious in the uh, gold miners. I agree with you, uh, Andre, on that. And again, this little gap here, not enough to really worry about, especially since these are. Uh, I'm talking like, um, what's his name, Captain Kirk? Especially. Since these are <laughs> commodity related stocks. Sound a little bit like Bernie Sanders too. Bernie Bernie Sanders too. Easy for me to say. But yeah, that's a TKO. Um almost a little bit bigger would be kind of cool. But yeah, I, I would call that a TKO. This is one of the very or similar to what I call a double top knockout, where a market kind of flattens out, makes a bit of a double top, and then you have a bam. TKO move. Uh, again, there's variations of TKOs and that we'll have to get into that at some other point. But I agree with you on that for the most part. The bar in May looks better. The bar in May. What stock were we on? I forget. Uh, the bar in May. What, uh, what symbol was that, Rick? Could you remind me? Uh, Howard says, I don't use RSI, but he says headed RSI to close of yesterday at 2.8. Well, uh, the problem with RS is RSI a bound indicator? I forget. Anyone know? By bound, I mean, see, I don't use indicators, but uh, by bound, I mean it can only go so high. Uh, RSI, here we go. RSI, I don't even know how to plot an indicator. That's pretty embarrassing. I plot custom indicators. Where did it go? Y'all bear with me a second. Big Dave's going to try to plot an indicator. Oh, my God. Hell is going to freeze over. Shows you how cumbersome I am with an indicator. Here we go. Let's put it in the middle. And using a two-peer, you said? Okay. I forget if it's bound or not. Uh... Yeah, zero to a hundred. Okay, so I don't know. I'm showing it at fifty. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. You're on TCK. TCK. Um, still showing it at fifty. Maybe I'm doing something wrong. 
Uh, the only reason I plotted this was not to make a case for or against indicators, but actually against indicator, indicators. If you're trading a bound indicator, let me put a stochastic again because I used to understand stochastics a little bit. Uh, do they have stochastics in TC? They have to. All right, let's put that uh, in the middle. That's all pretty, isn't it? Look at how pretty that is. Let me get rid of all that. All right, y'all bear with me. Let me try to plot an indicator. My problem with a bound indicator is, let me see if I could talk through it as I get it plotted, is that it can only go so high, it can only go so low. So a stochastic, and I just plotted a like a whatever this is. I don't know if I let me draw a bar. But a stochastic can only go to 100 and only go to zero. So at, at 100 or whatever, it's going to really look like it's overbought. Let's take a look at uh, let's take a look at RYI. Oh, oh, oh! It's overbought. Stochastic is at 100. Oh, it's overbought. We better sell. Stochastic at 100. Better sell. Stochastic at 100. Better sell. Stochastic at 100. Ooh, we better sell. Stochastic at 100. You know. <laughs> Ooh, we better sell. Stochastic at 100. <laughs> and then finally, the market implodes. So. Be careful if you're going to use a bound indicator, something that has a maximum and a minimum, okay? So look, it's at zero. You should be buying it right now, right? Okay, yeah, good luck with that. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm kind of uh, – I'm not an indicator guy other than the occasional moving average. While does RSI two-period close at 273 yesterday? Yeah, that, that's meaningless to me. That means nothing to me. But if it means something to you – then you need to did you need to do whatever you do when that happens okay remove it quick before it breeds <laughs> is cci unbounded i don't know i don't think it is that's commodity channel index macklinburg and connor wrote about to a superior rsi yeah they took they they borrowed that from linda rasky they got that from linda rasky um they weren't a big fan of it at first and then they uh, like it RSI is 0 to 100, I think. Yeah, I don't know. RSI bounds. Yeah, RSI is bound. Yeah, you guys know a lot about indicators. Just be careful with them. Um, you know, my experience has been people who were successful with indicators would be successful without them. Because I've looked over the shoulder with some of these guys, and I'm like, um, hey, you got a signal. And he's like, yeah, but I don't like and they'll point out what's going on in the chart and why they didn't take the signal, okay? So I'm just not a huge fan of indicators. It, indicators all have lag, okay? As the moving averages have a lot of lag, too. The, the, the beauty of the moving average, the, the one indicator that I will use, and I don't use it as an indicator. I use it as an illustrator. There's a big difference, and that's something that I often talk about. Sometimes you're looking at a market that looks like those slides we were talking about earlier, and you might not notice that it's lost momentum. Let me see if I can, I can pull a slide out. You might be looking at something like this, okay? And before you draw these trend lines in there and everything, you might just see this big blue arrow in the chart, okay, in your mind's eye or even draw it in. But the beauty of a moving average is – is that it might begin to kind of roll over in here, okay? And maybe even at some point begin to bow tie. And you're busy looking at this big blue arrow and it's like, well, wait a minute. Oh, I see what Dave's saying. This market has lost some steam. Now, it already lost steam. The moving average didn't necessarily predict it, but the moving average might help to illustrate it, okay? Okay, uh, yeah, let's look at a few things on the um, market, and then we'll hop into those questions. Your RYI comments had all of your peeps who front-ran the setup run out just now, just my opinion, Angelo. Well, yeah, and that's a problem, okay? And that's 
that's good and bad. Okay, it's good for business because I think I can have unlimited people on my service. Not that an unlimited amount of people want to be on my service, but in case someday I ever did a little marketing or whatever, yeah, I could have more people on the service. Some people ask me going in, Dave, I'm going to the service. You think there's too many people in the service following it? No. No. Okay. And the reason it is because human nature never changes. I could preach until I'm blue in the face. Hey, guys, here's a setup. Wait for an entry. Okay. What did I just say? I told, you know, I told the story a thousand times. Here goes, here goes a thousand and one. Hey, Dave, that, R I, that RYI piece of crap you recommended – RYI, I don't remember that stock. Yeah, you remember it. You recommended it on July 18th, 2016. Really? Let's go look at that. Oh, yeah, that was a pretty good looking TKL. It never triggered. So <laughs> the point is like, yeah, my peeps, are get, my peeps who front ran are getting knocked out. That's possible. You know, it really is. But don't, don't try to outsmart a system. Just follow it. Hey, write that down. It's pretty good. All right, let's take a take a look at uh, the market a little bit, and then we'll uh, take a look at the. Uh, and I'll get to those other questions too. Need to lose the average. I'm not sure what that means. Uh, let's take a look at the P's first. Now P's are up here at all time highs uh, today, notwithstanding coming in a little bit. They are losing a little bit of steam. Okay, what did we just talk about? We talked about a market losing steam. Not enough to get worried about just yet. Oh, let's see what the stochastics are doing. But the stochastic, oh, look at the, oh, look at the stochastics losing steam, okay? Well, they're just illustrating what's going on. Yeah, but that's stochastic estate. That's stochastic estate overbought for a long, long time. Just remember that. All right, before I dig myself a hole with indicators, which I don't use anyway, a couple things. We're very overbought in here, and we have lost some steam longer term. By the way, somebody was talking about the VIX this morning. I think it was in uh, Tom McClellan's uh, forum. Tom McClellan has a forum similar to John Bollinger's forum. And I, I kind of lurk a lot in there. I don't really uh, contribute much. I'm not proud that I don't contribute. I just, it just, it is what it is. I want to make sure I have something good to say before I say it. But one thing that they were talking about was the VIX. And I was pretty amazed. I'm like, at how low the, the VIX was. It's been a while since I paid much attention to the VIX. So, again, there's always something to worry about, but we're down here towards multi-year lows in the VIX. And then we're also a little bit stretched. And I was looking at some moving averages right before the show. So let's take a look at, uh, at 200, just to kind of give you an average VIX. You can see the average VIX is way up here. And then maybe let's take a look at the 50-day. I, I don't want to digress too much into the VIX. But, yes, there's always something to worry about when it comes to markets. And it's even stretched fairly far away for the 50-day moving average. Now, you'll notice when, when, when the VIX gets really stretched away, it's a top or a bottom. So that is a little nerve, that is a little concerning, okay, that the VIX has begun to stretch away significantly from those moving averages. Ideally, you want to see that kind of flatten out a little bit so it's not so stretched. But getting back to the P's, you can see we are up in nosebleed up in here, territory which is good, don't get me wrong. But I'd like to see them continue to clear these prior highs in here before meaningful correction. My concern is if it corrects now too much, then we're back to below the breakout point, and that would be concerning. Right now, it's kind of like an all clear, and everybody's running around, kissing each other, and all excited. And hey, as a trend follower, I'm okay with that. I'm fine with that too. But you have to ask yourself, self, if this thing begins to correct, would it come back in below those prior highs? And I guess like Potter, Stewart, or whatever his name is, we'll know when we see it, okay? But it's something that's in kind of the back of my mind. And we're still overbought. A leg on top of the leg is going to be difficult. Stranger things have happened. But again, I just like to see that correction happen a little further down the road as opposed to now. Let's take a look at the NASDAQ. NASDAQ especially yesterday, pushed really nicely into the overhead supply. Still has some overhead supply to deal with, okay? I still think this market could be skittish longer term, uh, or at least seriously over the short term, should we end up with uh, a serious correction. If, if we have a, a sharp move 
it's going to be very telling. Does everybody run to the door or is that like a one and done, maybe like TKO-ish type of behavior? So we'll just have to wait and see what happens on that. And by the way, as a trend follower, there's a lot of wait to see what happens. Sometimes in the service, I'm like, okay, guys, it looks pretty good. But let's wait to see what happens. It's like, oh, my goodness. I get sick of myself here, and I can't imagine <laughs> you guys and girls. Uh, Russell 2000, a little bit more concerning. Still has quite a bit of overhead supply. Uh, what's the net net? You can go all the way back to 2013 or so. And you can see we haven't made much forward progress now, at least 2014 actually lower than we were well over a year ago. So that's a little concerning when you have that big longer-term sideways arrow pointing sideways. But, again, as a trend follower, I'm not going to argue with what it's done recently. But shorter term, and that goes back to that net-net chart. Again, let's not forget about the what? The net-net, okay? So shorter term, it does have a little bit of that look to it, not quite as bad as I illustrated in that chart. So it has lost a little steam in here, and it is up against a little bit of overhead supply. So one thing that concerns me is that a market that goes overbought into overhead supply it is kind of a dangerous – it's, dang, it's a dangerous juncture to buy a market that's overbought right as it's hitting overhead supply. It's kind of like a double whammy against you. I would not short it. Okay, let me repeat. I would not short it because it's overbought, because there is resistance or overhead supply, however you want to look at it. But I certainly wouldn't rush out and buy it. Okay, um, keep the questions coming. Um, sectors, I still like the energies and metals and mining because they can trade contra to the overall market. I still think we have major big picture bottoms in place here. Gold, the commodity, take a look at like a weekly bow tie here. And you can see we had a weekly bow tie, gold, the commodity coming off of major, major lows. Okay, it's not all-time lows, but close enough. I mean, well, not close enough, but it's coming off of 10-year lows or so. Or was it six-year lows? So it's significant. So I think gold, the commodity, which, by the way, I think is is a possible setup in and of itself. I'd rather trade a gold stock, but gold, the commodity, looks pretty darn good. Okay. And then the point I wanted to make earlier is that some of these sectors that had been kind of dubious or sideways, like the banks have recently broken out. Some areas like the semis, when you have time, just go through all the sectors. But some areas like the semis are kind of melting up in here, which is kind of cool. Uh, the corrections here will be telling. We'll, we could see a lot of uh, setups. Putting in terms of Fibonacci, what would your TKO be 23 or 38%, somewhere in between? Uh, I don't use Fibonacci. I mean, I have one minor pattern. I use a little bit of it, but I actually eyeball that. It's not – it kind of sets up within Fibonacci, but I wouldn't give Fibonacci too much credit on that, okay? Um, I don't know because 38% might be too much of a retracement depending on the stock, okay? Um, it all depends on the volatility of the stock, the momentum of the stock, on how wide that bar should be. It should be pretty obvious, though. It should be able to, it should just jump out at you. Okay, dollar yen, gold and silver, dollar yen. Yeah, okay, that we just looked at gold. Uh, yeah, let me just start looking at everything else. Um, silver looks pretty interesting in here. Uh, I'm not too worried about this gap down. It's a commodity. We'll give it a pass. I think I'd like to see a little bit more. Somebody was just asking me about a knockout. I'd like to see a tiny bit more knockout move in here, but I think. Um, it's 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 taken off so much in here that I'm not sure we're going to get that perfect little setup in these commodities before we're able to get back on. So GLD and SLV, uh, the yen, I forget the symbol on the yen. I used the other one. Um, anybody know FXI, is it? FXI. Yeah, there it is. Uh, or is that an index fund? That's a China index fund. FXY. I was closed. Yeah, uh, this looks like it's in trouble as far as the yen is concerned. Uh, and then longer term is kind of interesting. Longer term, what do we have going on, Andre? Well, we're we're kind of – we had an overbought situation into supply. What was I just preaching about? Overbought into supply, not a good place to buy. Hey, write that down. If it's overbought into supply, it's not a good place for you to buy. Huh, I like that. Dr. Seuss. <laughs> Anybody see that uh, parody? 
I did not write the speech with a goat. I did not write the speech on the boat. Um, yeah, it looks like it's in trouble. It looks like it could bow tie down. So, yeah, with the currencies, I'd be maybe looking to short the yen. Maybe buy the dollar, huh? You take a look at the dollar. I don't know. Let's see. I, I just prefer looking at the actual Forex charts. Um, well, a dollar, there's really no trade in the dollar, but it has worked its way higher. So it looks like the dollar's headed higher, yen's headed lower. So, yeah, it could be a could be a dollar yen trade. Buy the dollar, short the yen. Okay. SLV is five gaps up, so it's six one now. Gap down. Well, don't get too caught up in commodity gaps. Uh, also, here's the thing to think about SLV. Uh, anybody know what time silver opens? Futures. I used to know all this in the back of my head. Um, but the the spot market is open 24 hours, so a lot of the gaps might just be reflecting. You know, go go take a look at a spot chart. There will be no gaps in a spot chart. Okay, so you got to think of a commodity as something that trades 24/7 in that gaps. You can't give the gap as much credence as you would in like a stock where there's that pent up demand coming in overnight and everybody rushes for the door. Okay. With your bow ties, do you ever use a hull MA to make them? I don't know what that is. Hull MA? H-U-L-L? -L? Don't know what that is. Uh, I just keep it simple. Simple and exponential moving averages. Only two indicators I ever use. Not the only two I've never used, but only two I ever use. I tried everything at one point. Yeah, EXK, uh, you know, here's a case where you've got a stock that pulled back into its prior little peak, its little breakout. I think that you could probably, if the underlying commodity looks like that, okay, then you want to find a stock that could do at least that well. Whereas EXK is eh, not quite as, not that it's not going higher, okay, but it just it just looks like it's in, in I wouldn't say trouble, but it's not a stock I would run out and buy because it's pulled back to its parlor breakout in here. USO, yeah, USO is a little bit uh, questionable. I'm still kind of bullish on the energies. Uh, USO has lost some steam in here, okay? And that's the only thing that has me a little bit concerned. Longer term, and this is a weekly chart. It looks like it's trying to bottom out. Sometimes in these commodities, it could be more of a process than an event, as you know. Euro, Euro, I'm kind of, uh, I don't know what I am on the euro. I always forget. When I make a trade in Forex, I forget what, what I actually bought or sold. Um, what if I have? Well, I don't have it pulled up, ready to go. Yeah, let's. I could. We could get it to currencies one day. Uh, there's too many stocks to cover right now. CDE is going to be a, a silver stock. And yeah, that's kind of a knockout move. That's kind of like it, it kind of wakes you up, but it needs to be. It needs to be a little bit bigger on the knockout move, okay? That's the only thing that I'd like to see. A little bit more serious knockout. You know, oh, Dave, how about 30-day moving average? Well, in some cases, that might actually work out pretty good. Maybe that could be your litmus test. But I'd much rather just eyeball the stock. So, yeah, that's kind of a TKO, but it's not a setup that I would trade. But I hear you. Sometimes these commodity-related stocks, they just won't let you on. And somebody said that before, um, that sometimes a, a great trend won't let you in. Uh, no. See, somebody just asked about X. No. See, we talked about this one last week. You, you broke out past this peak, but then it came back in in there, okay? So, again, you know, uh, see, no matter how much I talk about simple technical analysis, and I think, oh, my God, I'm beating the dead horse on this. Why would I bother talking about this? Maybe I should be talking about something a little bit more complex. But then as soon as I do, not to beat you up, whoever just said that, I, already, I, I don't even know who asked the question. I already deleted the question. But never forget about the net-net, okay? Such an important concept. Technical analysis does not have to be that technical. I never said it was easy, but don't try to make something happen where it doesn't exist, okay? So, yeah, I, I think you could find something better. Let's take a look at metals and mining overall. Uh, well, they are kind of pulling back in, so bad, uh, bad example. But let's take a look at like, gold within metals and mining. Uh, looking pretty good, okay? 
So yeah, don't buy something that's pulled back to its prior breakout. As a general statement, look at DLR short bow tie forming DLR. Uh, I wouldn't. I, I bet a well. Let's see. Yeah, no, you could be a while with that bow tie, but yeah, it's a pretty serious drop. Uh, interesting. You brought up the REITs. The REITs could be the mother of all shorts here. So good eye on that one, Howard. Uh, let's take a look at bonds. Okay, bonds, as I said in the slides from last week, a bit of a nosebleed up here. Hard to believe that rates are that low. Doesn't mean it can't go lower. But at one point, at some point, you think they have to stop. But yeah, bonds themselves losing a little steam. Your DLR losing a little steam in here. Um, there it is. Uh, that looks more like a first thrust lower. So we'll have to see how on the bounce and whether it's worth a short or not. But yeah, good eye on that one. RS, not sure if I reviewed it. RS. Yeah, it looks pretty good. That's a, a metal fab stock. Oops, uh, today's data, sorry. No, see, there's your question about TKOs right there. Perfect example. It's kind of like that RYI, which I think was also a, a metal stock. RYI, it sounds like a pirate stock, doesn't it? All right. Uh, I need to break the Prozac in half tomorrow. Um. Yeah, you know, you pulled all the way back to your prior breakout. Again, not to beat you up, but net, net, okay? Six, seven, what's that? Uh, six weeks worth of trading? Okay, no, you pull back too far into the prior base, okay? No matter how many times I talk about net, net, <laughs> I'm in a mood, huh? Ren for Rick. This is Rin's Rinrick. Okay. Well, sometimes you can have too much of a good thing. You went from 250 to 8 over a short period of time. I call that a bottle rocket. And to those of you who are from the South and a redneck like me, you know what a bottle rocket is. To those of you who don't know what a bottle rocket is, it's a little firework you stick in a bottle. It's the name bottle rocket. And they take off like a rocket. They go and it's like they're going to go to the move, and then they go, pop. They just kind of lose steam really quick. So this would be what I call a bottle rocket. Very dangerous stock to trade because it made such a big move over a short period of time. I would avoid this stock at all costs. It's just not worth it. Also, look at the HV. HV pretty high in here, okay? John says, thanks. I don't know what he's thanking me for, but you're welcome. <laughs> what's your, what's your part? What's a part's favorite letter? Answer S E A. Oh, we better not get into pirate jokes. V and R. V and R. Yeah, that's kind of interesting. This is one I've been watching. Um, it's a bit of a penny stock. It is on my list. I do like it. It has it does have some overhead supply uh, to deal with, but by the time it breaks out, it would have cleared a lot of that. It, it made a nice big base in between, and then I don't want to talk out of both sides of my mouth, but with overhead supply, okay, you're only looking at a little bit of it in here. You measure it three ways, how long it is, how wide it is, how far, well, four ways, how far away it is from the current levels. If you have overhead supply up here at eight bucks a share, who cares? If a stock goes up 500%, who cares? That's a good problem to have. Uh, this is way back in 2015. Not that you want to completely ignore it, but over the last year, it's probably safe to say that somebody who owned this stock probably got a divorce and had to sell the stock. Somebody who owned the stock probably died. The kids got a hold of the money, and they probably sold the stock, okay? Somebody got bored with the stock because it was going sideways and probably sold the stock. So a lot of that supply does work its way through the market. Now, markets do have long memories. Sometimes that overhead supply, even though it's a couple of years back, is still relevant because people will hold on forever. But through time, there is a bit of an attrition that happens. Uh, Dick Fruth, good friend of mine over from Houston, Texas, running several hundred million dollars over there. Uh, very impressive operation, small office. And he believes, uh, he, he calls it um, the uh, 
the tombstone pattern where these stocks go down a base for a long, long time. But he uses like an extremely long time. And a lot of the things that I talk about with, with what I call like a, a Phoenix strategy, kind of like these stocks that are rising from the ashes, are very similar uh, in similar vein with uh, uh, with Dick. And that's how we became friends because I was just banging through a bunch of charts at a break. And I looked over and he was banging through a bunch of charts on, um, on Telechart. We were doing the same thing. And that's how we became friends. And we also realized we both like to drink beer and and behave like young kids. Uh, but yeah, that looks pretty good. Uh, definitely keep it on your radar. You know, speculative, super speculative. Okay. There's a huge run up over a short period of time, but it is kind of a, a penny stock plus a pullback. But yeah, absolutely. This, this is one that's on my list. Uh, but it's, but it's very speculative, very dangerous stock to trade, but absolutely. YRD and a pullback. No, that's going to have too much overhead resistance. Maybe not. Oh, wrong stock. I was thinking of something else. Uh, yeah, why not? Uh, yeah. Um, ideally, though, you'd like to see it kind of clear this prior peak a little bit more, but we'll know when we see it. Wait till it pulls back and then ask again. RYI and GBT recent setups uh, screwed by new stock issuance. I know. Ignore fundamentals. Well, I don't know if that's fundamentals. That's confusing the issue with facts. Um, but yeah, that's that's aggravating. CDE, CDE. That's going to be a silver stock. Um, we talk about this one. Yeah, it didn't pull back enough. STLD knockout. What happens if just putters near the low of the knockout like this? Does it need to go right back up to still be interesting for Jeff? STLD. Well, in this particular case, it pulled back to its prior breakout point, okay? And also, as I said before, let me show you something here. Sometimes uh, you can't forget about the net-net, okay? <laughs> and let's see what we got here. So, look, net-net from, let's go to this little peak here. Okay, so you got two and a half months of uh, pretty much no change. Yes, longer term, it might still be, it might look like it's going up, but over the short to intermediate term, or someone in the medium term, I should say it's going sideways. So never forget about the net net. I don't know if I've mentioned that before or if I said anything about it today, but never forget it, okay? BNR has overhead and a gap a little while back, bow tie off lows, what are your thoughts? Uh, yeah, we talked about that one. Yeah, you know, I'm loving the fact that you guys are starting to catch on and say things like, hey, Dave, I like this stock. Got a little overheard supply, but I like this stock. So, of course, you're, you're making my job easy. Copper, what's the copper uh, ETF? I'll, we'll pull that up in a second. Meat for Rick. Um, no, this was, that, this was the example we looked at earlier. Not enough TKO, okay? So it had to look something like that. We actually had a chart on that earlier. Uh, if you're just joining us, then um, watch the uh, – thank you, Sam. Uh, watch the the YouTube, which will be out in a couple hours. Okay, this is uh, – no, these are grains. Somebody said copper is JJG. These are grains. Um, grains not looking so hot. But, hey, middle of summer could still have a drought, right? Copper, BRSS, like brass, BRSS. What do you call a dog with no high lanes, no hind legs, with no balls and no, no, wait, how's this, how's the joke go? What do you call a dog with brass balls and no hind legs? Sparky. And then the person I was working for at the time explained to me that he didn't find the joke funny because copper's a non-ferrous metal. And I'm like, oh, brass is a non-ferrous metal. Oh, oh well, I still think it's a funny joke. Um, sometimes you're too smart to understand a joke. Yeah, uh, it's okay. It, it didn't really clear the prior little peak in here. When, when I'm looking at something that's very commodity related, um, I'm more excited about them when they're coming off of these major, major lows, like back here and then bow tie or something like that. Okay. Aaron says you're on a roll today. <laughs> I'm sorry. AU. I apologize you ladies if you don't, uh, 
most of the ladies I've met who trade are uh, are not easily offended. <laughs> so I don't, ha- I don't suppose I don't have to worry too much. Uh, yeah, AU was kind of a double top knockout, but you know maybe I'm looking for too much perfection in these goals, and maybe that's why I hadn't caught enough gold stocks this year. These commodity-related stocks like gold are a little tougher to trade because of the underlying commodity. It can't be choppy and all. Um, this is almost a textbook TKO, like a double top knockout, with the exception of this move need to be a li- needs to be a little bit bigger. Um, but yeah, keep it on your radar. It's just not set up now. You're on the service, so use uh, look at the one we're looking at. Joe for Donald, and Karen is Long Joe. Joe is I think that's copper. Yeah, but see, it's it's lost a little momentum in here. If you're long, stay long because it looks like it's still in a pretty good trend. Uh, but you can see how choppy commodities can be. But yeah, it looks like it's working its way higher. A H H. I'm gonna have to go into lightning round here. Ooh, I think we're almost done. A H H. Yeah, on a pullback, absolutely. What's it doing today? Yeah. But you know, it's a REIT. It's kind of hard for me to get excited about a REIT. Lower in volatility, still still dangerous to trade. I S R G. Intuitive. Yes, this could be a hard stock to trade. Uh, don't think I've heard you talk about gap retracements. Now it's about fifty percent of gap. Um, yeah, when you get these big wide gaps, they 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 can be a little crazy. Um, I hear you. I mean, it's gapping up to all time highs, pulling back a little bit. Uh, I call it an explosive gap pivot, Phil. If you've ever, if you have, I think it was in Ten Best I wrote about that. This gap's a little bit extreme given the volatility of this stock, so I probably wouldn't trade it, number one, based on volatility to begin with. Um, number two, the size of the gap, a little bit too big. And one thing I don't like about Intuitive, at least longer term, is it tends to trade in chunks, uh, but it has kind of worked its way higher as a lay. But you can see it's kind of all over the place longer term. Okay. Sorry, I meant GHG on London Exchange. GHG. Oh, okay. I don't have uh, those charts readily accessible. Okay. Sorry, not sparry. <laughs> seeper, no volume. Seeper, seeper. Yeah. Why would you? Yeah, okay. I got gotcha. you for copper. Yeah, just kind of chopping around. But yeah, you can email. Uh, yeah, Mark, that's fine. You can email it to me. Send me the chart too. Just make my life easier. I need to get all that. I've been working to get all that data uploaded. I, there's just too much to do. Uh, this looks good. Yeah, but you're going to have to wait for a pullback on that, obviously. Matt's this great show. Thank you, Matt. Okay, let's see if we can get a few more in real quick. Yeah, Mark, I don't have those charts readily available. Uh, I'm sorry. WPZ tightening stop looks like rejecting higher prices. WPZ. Yeah, uh, I think you can find some. See, that's this is an oil refiner. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of the refinery stocks. Refinery stocks tend to trade uh, opposite of oil because uh, oil is a um, cost of goods sold. But yeah, I think you can find something better in the oils if you want to trade oil in and of itself. But if you're long, stay long. It's fine. STLD, we look at that one. Yeah, again, yeah, pull back. We talked about that one. All right, well, look, we're out of time. I appreciate everybody coming here, taking time out of the busy schedule. I'm, I'm humbled by your uh, showing up and the fact that uh, everyone stayed till the end, or most everyone. So that's exciting. Um, you're welcome, Donald. Thank you so much. Again, if anything's unanswered, which I see we have quite a few unanswered questions this week, and it's so funny coming to the show, I'm like, I'm thinking, well, maybe I'll just go an hour today, but it's like here I'm an hour and a half and we'll still get questions. So that's I'm excited about that. But anything unanswered, shoot me an email, daviddavelander.com. Answers requiring a lot of thought will become fodder for next week's show, and that's that's fine too. And that'll give me because I don't always know what to talk about. And usually you guys help me out with that, so I appreciate that. Anyway, if we don't talk between now and then, everyone have a fantastic weekend. And then I hope to see all you guys and girls again next Thursday. Thank you so much.